Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us once again across the vast Louisiana plain where we are elevating the cause of liberty and freedom, advancing justice each and every day and slowly but surely draining the Louisiana swamp. My name is Chris. And I'm Danielle. And this is the State of Freedom brought to you by freedom loving Louisiana First Patriots. Hello, State of Freedom Warriors. We are so grateful for you. We're so happy to be back with you. So honored that you would have us along for part of your day. We're only here because of your encouragement, your prayers, and your financial support. If you're looking for a way to support us, to advertise with us, or to send us feedback, please visit our website at freedomstate.us. We'd love it and really appreciate it if you'd help us get the word out and spread the reach of the State of Freedom. If you would, please like the show on whatever platform you listen to us, subscribe to it and share it. Give us a five-star review. Don't forget that we're also on YouTube when they're not busy censoring us or suspending our channel. And we're always on Rumble where the freedom of speech reigns supreme. The links to those are in the show notes and over on freedomstate.us. Moms for Liberty East Baton Rouge Paris Chapter is dedicated to fighting for the survival of America by unifying, educating, and empowering parents to defend and take back their parental rights at all levels of government. To learn more or to get involved with Moms for Liberty East Baton Rouge, email momsforlibertybatonrouge at gmail.com. That's moms, the number four, libertybatonrouge at gmail.com. The email address is on the Patriot page of our website, freedomstate.us, and it's in the show notes. Well, today we'll be walking through the fourth episode of our session in review series. We'll be talking about the budget, taxes, and the Second Amendment, so stay tuned. Before we get there, let me read the scripture of the day. It's Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. And just to set it up a little bit, this scripture is at the end of the book of Jonah, after Jonah has repented of running from his assignment, after he was spit up from the belly of the whale and took the Lord's instruction to Nineveh and prophesied to the people the destruction of them and their city because of their wickedness. The people heard what Jonah said. They heard the word of the Lord and they responded. They fasted and they repented, turning from their wickedness. The book of Jonah describes them as totally wicked, yet they turned from their wickedness. And Jonah was very angry because he knew the Lord would have compassion on them if they did repent. But he had seen their great wickedness and wanted them to face judgment instead of mercy. So that's the setup for this scripture. And this is what the Lord tells Jonah in response to his anger. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh? the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand and their left, as well as many animals. And doesn't that seem like exactly where we are right now? I want to see God's judgment on the wicked. I do. I feel like Jonah in my heart a lot of days saying, Lord, come and judge the wicked. And I was really encouraged by this passage. It gave me hope for so many people Because I do believe that a good number of people that we even consider to be wicked will repent and are repenting even now. Look at how the Lord sees them as not knowing their right hand from their left. That's the same thing as not knowing if they're a boy or a girl. That's the same thing we're seeing play out in absolute demonic fashion in our society. So let us be ones who learn from Jonah's mistake and agree with the Lord saying, Lord, turn their hearts. Let us see as many of these wicked and completely lost people repent and come to know you, return them to their right mind and right identity and make them whole again. And Danielle, it's not God's desire that anyone should be lost. I think the scripture says that it's not God's desire that anyone should be lost. It's his desire that we should all be saved. But Jonah seems to be, the scripture that you read seems to be alluding to the fact that there are When people don't know the left from their right, it's almost as though they don't really know what's right and what's wrong in certain instances. And they're following, but they're following people and listening to people who are guiding them down the wrong path. That's the first thing that jumped out at me. The second thing that jumped out at me is that I think it's almost human nature 
when we see great injustice being done in the world, that we want God's wrath, we want his punishment, we want him to come and make it all right. But really, our heart should be uh, in a place of mercy. Our heart should be in a place of hope for all people to repent, for all people, because God is rich in mercy and slow to anger. We have to remember that God is rich in mercy and slow to anger, but he can't have mercy until we acknowledge our sins and we acknowledge our repentance or else what is he having mercy on? And so it's so important uh, for us to maintain an attitude of mercy and continue to pray that everyone in the world would turn to God, would acknowledge our sinfulness, and then he will forgive because he is rich in mercy, and he will restore all that is lost. That is another promise of Scripture. It is another promise of Scripture. And I think we're going to be really surprised by the people that turn You know, we've seen it already. We've seen people who we thought celebrities or even politicians turn to the Lord. And I think, you know, that that we've seen a sprinkling of that, but I think we're just about to see them turn to the Lord in large, large numbers. And it's going to, I think, really take a lot of people off guard. But I'm excited about that. And I really do think it's coming. It's going to be extremely powerful, and uh, I have great, great anticipation for it because, you know, nothing can be hidden from God. He sees everything all the time, and His justice is perfect. He is a God of perfect justice, yeah. and that's one thing that we can be hopeful and that we can anticipate. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, speaking of anticipation, I think probably our listeners are in anticipation of what happened this session when it relates to the budget, to taxes, and definitely to the Second Amendment. So why don't we get into it? Let's rock. All right, here we go. Starting out with a couple bills on the budget. The first one is House Bill 48 by Representative Bacala. It was a constitutional amendment related to the budget. And it just said that the House must have the opportunity to consider any appropriations that come back from the Senate with substantial amendments. They have two days to do that. Absolutely. Very, very important. And again, it's to prevent the debacle that occurred at the 11th hour of the session in 2023 when the House did not even have time to review hundreds of millions of dollars of added appropriations that were made on the Senate side. They didn't know where the money was going, how it was being spent, and they had about 30 minutes to review all these amendments and make a vote on it. This bill is in response to that. It did pass and will be going to the people in November for a vote. I don't anticipate, Danielle, that there will be a huge controversy regarding this. I think this should pass substantially when it gets to the people. Yeah. And, you know, Chris, I think it bears mentioning that in 2023, the budget debacle is what will lead is leading to the anticipated 2025 budget shortfall. So let us not forget that. We're probably going to be having a special session related to uh, the Constitution and the budget to move things around so the legislature has more flexibility in how they handle that so they won't have to only cut from the education section of the budget. They won't have to only cut from the health care section of the budget, but they have more flexibility in the places that really could use some trimming, most likely anyway. I wanted to mention a couple things about how this bill made it through the chambers because it really struggled to get out of committee. It was first voluntarily deferred in House and Governmental Affairs, and it got brought back up and voted on without amendments. And what was funny to me about this is that the Democrats on the committee supported the bill along with three Republicans, Mike Bayham, Les Barnum, and Rodney Shammerhorn. Now, I find this kind of hysterical because all of the rest of the Republicans on the committee voted against it. And if I had to guess, I'd say that it was probably because Governor Landry made gave the Republicans marching orders not to do any constitutional amendments this session because he believed that the convention was going to be happening, which we now know did not manifest. So these Republicans stood down and the Democrats, I guess, just voted for it because the Republicans opposed it, which is which is pretty funny. So wanted to make sure everyone knew about that. But after that rough start, it moved through without without too much trouble, and it has been filed, like you said, Chris, with the Secretary of State, and it'll be on the ballot this November. If the people are found in favor of it, it will become law on December 7th. 
And from that point forward, the House will always have at least 48 hours to make sure they understand where our tax dollars are going specifically and have an opportunity to review and vote up and down in an informed way, again, to prevent uh, the debacle that, are, that occurred in 2023, which really will live in ignominy. There's no question uh, what occurred there should never, ever happen again on the floor of the Louisiana State Legislature. This constitutional amendment will go a long way in preventing that from happening. Yep. And House Bill 49 by Representative Bacala is basically its partner bill. It's another constitutional amendment that would allow for a two-day extension on the session if there's further debate needed on the budget. Yeah, if you're running up against the last day of the session and you've got all kinds of appropriations measures and amendments you have to look at, this will allow, if it's passed, will allow an extension of a couple of days at a time past the regular end of the session so that they can have time again to review these appropriations measures. Another very important provision. I think this one also will should pass on a statewide ballot with little controversy. It's amazing, Danielle. Let me let me just say this real quick. One thing, it's amazing to me how when things get to the people, when sensible things actually get to the people of Louisiana for a vote, they almost always do the right thing. I would say that they do the right thing more often frequently than their elected representatives do the right thing in the legislature. Unfortunately, everything cannot go to a constitutional amendment. But if more things did go directly to the people, let me tell you what, they get it right the vast majority of the time. Chris, when you talk about that, I always have some hesitations around it because I don't trust our voting systems. I don't trust our election systems. And so to say that when it goes to the people, the people do the right thing. Absolutely. I'm in 100 percent agreement with you. But when we look at cases like Ohio and the abortion ballot initiative, I don't think the state of Ohio voted in favor of abortion. I really don't. I don't think that a lot of these times where the state of Louisiana on an off cycle year votes to raise our own taxes. I don't think that's what the people want. Yeah. So I, I don't have a lot of faith in our election system as it currently is. Of course, we still have to vote, but I get very nervous when it comes to ballot initiatives because they don't always go the way we want. I don't think they always go the way we vote. Well, that's true, but often the margin of passage is sufficient to overcome you know, the fraud that may be built into the system. It might be one of the too big to rig deals, but I completely understand what you're saying about the problems in our election system. And we're going to certainly be talking about that on a future episode about the, the, the issues. Probably really. on a lot of future episodes. <laughs> a lot of future episodes in an effort to make sure that we have a truly secure voting system in Louisiana. Yeah. Well, just to round out how that bill sh got to where it is, the Republicans must have gotten tired of playing games after HB 48 because everyone in committee voted for this. The only person who voted against it in the entirety of the legislature is Representative Tammy Phelps. So wanted to make note of that. And like 48, it's been filed with Nancy Landry at the Secretary of State's office, and it'll be on the ballot in November. And if the people vote for it and the election system works, it will become law on December 7th. I'm not entirely convinced that Representative Phelps knew what she was voting on or, or why she was voting. Uh, fortunately, her vote was not instrumental in the outcome. Right. OK. Next up is House Bill 162 by Representative Boboyu. It was the bill that would limit the withdrawal of money from the capital outlay savings fund and require itemization for capital outlay projects. This bill made it all the way through the process without objection, and then Governor Landry vetoed it. We were pretty upset to see that. But the veto note said that the matter would be best addressed by another bill. The bill referenced is House Bill 786, which is currently pending legislative review. and. I had another thought on that and it escaped me. So maybe it'll come back to me while you talk, Chris. Yeah, but the thing about this is 786 is under uh, legislative review. And maybe that is to make sure that HB 162 and the provisions of HB 162 get fully added into that bill. You're right. 786 
is the bill that Governor Landry cited when he vetoed HB 162. And let me tell you what HB 162 did. It would have required a specific individualized itemization for any money that was appropriated from the capital outlay fund. This is where it's going. This is the purpose. And this is why we're doing it. And that's why it was very important. Representative Boyer was on our show talking about that. Well, Governor Landry vetoed that bill because he said 786 would address the issue. To a degree, 786 addresses the issue, but it's not as specific. 786 does require that no money can come out of the capital outlay fund without specific legislative approval, but I don't see that it requires an individualized, itemized determination and allocation and explanation for what the money is for. So I do not believe 786 is as strong a piece of legislation as HB 162 was. I don't think the governor should have vetoed that legislation. And we will see, hopefully, the since 786 is still currently pending legislative review, maybe that's because they are attempting to work in the original provisions, all of the original provisions of HB 162. And we can certainly hope that that's the case. But I am under no illusions. 786 is not as strong a piece of legislation as Representative Boyer's original bill, HB 162. It's just not. Yeah. And Chris, I did remember the thought that escaped me. I think one of the reasons for this, perhaps in favor of this, should 162 get woven into this this other bill, House Bill 786, is just for statutory efficiency, just to keep things clean. So all of the um, requirements around moving funds would be in one law. So hopefully that's the reason. Hopefully it makes things easier for people. And we do see, hopefully, that 162 gets added in to this. So Yes, because Louisiana taxpayers, Louisiana citizens, have a right to know specifically where every dime of their money is going. And they deserve an explanation for that, a specific, reliable explanation for where and how their money is being spent. And that's why HB 162 was important. And hopefully it will get woven into and incorporated into 786. Yeah. And Chris, we will be keeping an eye on this one because as we mentioned in our last episode with the update on 461, the state has a problem with transparency when it comes to our funds. And you can look at the roads to see that. You can look at crime to see that. You can look at our economic development. You can look at the state of our education system. You can look at any aspect of the state that's run by the state, managed by the state, and you can see that transparency is not in play. No, it is absolutely not. And it has to be fought for and protected because without transparency and accountability, again, there's no representative government. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Speaking of representative government, let's move on to the topic of taxes. House Bill 844 by Representative Neil Reiser, he came onto the show to talk about this bill. He was attempting to repeal the individual state income tax. This bill was purposefully and hung up in committee by Chairwoman Julie Emerson. They asked no questions and took no vote. So the bill had no action on it and just had nowhere to go. Is that right, Chris? That's exactly right. Representative Reiser gave a good explanation about how the abolition of the individual personal income tax in Louisiana could be done in a way that is revenue neutral, that would not require the government to dig in and, and pilfer us in other areas. I testified in favor of it right next to him. uh, And then there were no questions from the committee, no inquiry and no vote, which Neil said was highly unusual and quite surprising. Although when he speaks to representatives and senators privately, they all say they're for the abolition of the individual state income tax. As you said, Danielle, Neil did come on the show and explained in more detail about how this can be done in a revenue neutral way. I think it needs to be done. It is high time and we are going to be pushing it hard in the next session. And I know that uh, Representative Reiser is very, very eager about getting this done. Yeah, well, you know, it's very easy to say you're for a bill if you don't have to vote on it. Well, exactly. And let's just be straight. Let's be honest. 
they didn't want to have to take any action on it that would appear of record because they know that we would be reporting on their action. And anybody in the state of Louisiana who votes against the abolition of the individual state income tax, as much as we are taxed in this state, that would be a kiss of death and probably would usher in the demise of their political career and longevity. And so that's <laughs> the reason why they didn't want to touch it. We have to get this done. Yeah. And Representative Reiser will no doubt use this as one of his five bills in the fiscal session next year. No doubt. Okay, moving on to the Second Amendment. I know a lot of folks have been waiting for these updates, so let's get into it. The first one is House Bill 498 by Representative Alonzo Knox. His bill would have created firearm-free zones that would have made large swaths of cities restricted from law-abiding gun carriers. Any major entertainment district, you'd be prohibited from concealed carrying any major entertain entertainment district, which means any area that hosts annually 15 million or more people collectively for the year, any stadium that holds 75,000 people or more, any convention centers, large convention centers, and of course, the entire city of New Orleans would be uh, a gun-free <laughs> zone. I testified against this legislation. Uh, Representative Bacala did a very good job questioning on this bill. Fortunately, it failed in committee because we are not going to live in a state where we pass constitutional carry and codify a constitutional right and then start statutorily carving out all of these exceptions that end up eviscerating the rule. And so HB 498 was fortunately killed. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Representative Knox tries to bring it back again next year, but we will be at the table and we will be opposing it then just as well. Yeah. Speaking of bills that we oppose strongly, uh, next up is House Bill 408 by Representative Mandy Landry. This was her attempt to create a voluntary do not sell list. This is what I really claimed to be the dumbest bill of the session by far. And it also got killed in House criminal justice. I am mentally distressed. I am emotionally unstable. My salad is an olive or two short of a full Greek salad. And therefore, I'm coming to you, government, to let you know and to fall on my face. And if I happen to have a firearm, I want to surrender it to you. And I ask you and plead with you to please never allow me to purchase or to acquire a gun. And I do this totally voluntarily. This is the silliest thing that I think I've ever seen, but it's also dangerous, Danielle. It's extremely sinister, extremely yes. sinister. Because anything voluntary can slip right into being involuntary, can slip right into Big Brother, having your neighbor down the street, that nosy Nelly, say, you know what, I think I just saw Beretta arrive on UPS truck to so-and-so's house, so you might ought to go and raid him. Absolutely, you might ought to go and raid him. And another danger is that how many people do you think who are on this voluntary list, when they go to the government and say, look, I want you guys to know that I'm feeling an awful lot better. My stability has returned. My my mental faculties are, are fully functional now. And I feel like I'm on top of my game. Can I go ahead? I'd like to get off the list and I'd like to get my gun returned. I'm sure that the government officials would immediately comply, return the gun and take the individual off the list. You know, that's how government works, right, Danielle? That's how government works. They'll just have your gun in a nice safe space that's easy to access when you're ready and capable of getting it returned to your hands. I don't think so. Yes. And the government official would say, we thought you would never show up. We thought you would never come back, but here you are. Yeah. This is so stupid. So silly. I hope we never have to see this again. Yeah. And you know, there's another bill not related to the Second Amendment that was my runner up for dumbest bill of the session. So I want to take this opportunity to talk about that. It's by Representative Troy Romero. And his bill said that any electric vehicle charging station owned by, I believe, owned by the state needed to, it would, he would require it that 
EV charging station to only be powered by wind and solar. So I just found that amazing. I just, I don't know if he's on our side or just doesn't understand how power, energy, electronics work, how electric vehicles get charged, the power required to do that. But I thought that was pretty amazing. That one died in committee, unfortunately, but Yes. The only, the only thing that uh, would have made this bill even more silly would have been if the bill would have required the positioning of small windmills on top of the vehicles. Yeah, that's true. That would have been nice. Maybe they would just use pinwheels, you know, just get some. From yeah, the dollar exactly. Store. Yes. And, and, and with a little stipend yeah. so that everybody can afford the, the, the pinwheel. Uh, on that bill, but uh, no, this is this is. I think this is a very very close second as far as the, the the dumbest bill of the session. There are a couple other ones we could we could choose from, but we can talk about that on another episode. Yeah, those are my top two though for sure. Okay, back to the Second Amendment, House Bill six twenty seven by Representative Mandy Landry. This one would erode the second. Well, yeah, it would have eroded the Second Amendment right and constitutional carry that was just passed and not even effective is not even effective yet. It's It becomes effective July 4th, but this was connected to parade routes and permitted events. Yeah, and her original bill, Landry's original bill here, 627, would have prohibited any concealed carry within 1,000 feet of a uh, parade route, and it didn't matter whether you had a concealed carry permit or not. You simply could not carry uh, concealed within 1,000 feet of a parade. Ultimately, because of a lot of pressure, she amended the bill uh, to say that you can't carry within 100 feet of the center line of a parade, and she excluded permitted carriers from the prohibition. So if you had a permit, you could carry uh, in that area. Uh, But even as amended, the bill is not good because, as you and I have been championing and saying for so long now, it discriminates against constitutional carriers who do not have a government issued permit and we need to treat everyone the same way. And this bill would not have done that. The bill was slightly improved as amended. Fortunately, it still failed. And fortunately, well, not so fortunately, she'll she'll probably try to bring it back again next year. But for now, the Second Amendment remains safe. Well, Chris, you know my perspective on this, and I believe the listeners know my perspective on this. Any law that is not an affirmation of the Second Amendment that is related to the Second Amendment is an erosion and a violation of the Second Amendment. Absolutely. So do you believe in the Constitution or do you not? That is the question. And if you're bringing any bill that would erode that in any way, you are running afoul of the Constitution, and in my view, you are running contrary to your oath of office to uphold the Constitution, so get out of the way. Absolutely. Either you're faithful to the letter of the Second Amendment or you are not, and in the words of Ted Nugent, the Second Amendment is my concealed carry permit. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. All right. Well, just uh, to round out on this bill, obviously, Chris, we opposed it. I think that's pretty clear at this point. It made it out of House criminal justice in an 8-5 vote, and a couple Republicans voted for it. That's how it got out of the committee. So they were Chad Boyer, Vincent Cox, and Brian Fontenot. If they had voted against it, it would have been killed in committee as it should have been. Please refer to my former comments on the Second Amendment. And it did fail on the House floor in a 39-57 vote, largely on party lines, but with more crossover than usual. Republicans Chad Boyer, Vincent Cox, Daryl Desitel, Mike Johnson, Wayne McMahon, Brock Myers, Lori Schlegel, Joe Stagney voted with the Democrats against the Second Amendment. So everyone take note of those guys. And then Democrat Travis Johnson joined the rest of the Republicans in opposing it, staying true to his record so far of being very loyal to the Second Amendment. Absolutely. And Brian Fontenot's vote against this legislation is, is something that I do intend to bring up in a foreign a forum coming to a theater near you, because uh, that's not an acceptable vote. I agree with you 100 percent, Danielle. And to have Republicans saying that there is any area of the state in a public area where people gather and where people with malintent go uh, cannot conceal carry 
is both unconstitutional and very unwise, in my view. Either we believe that law-abiding citizens have a right to conceal carry to protect themselves, or we do not. And we do not have a right to reinvent or rewrite or reinterpret the Second Amendment. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next up, Senate Bill 419, which became Senate Bill 507 by Senator Kirk Talbot. This one started off not very far away from Landry's bill that we just discussed related to the parade routes. And it kind of mixed together. And Chris, you can probably, well, you'll do a better job of explaining it than me. But in my view, it was kind of a mix of Landry's parade route bill and Knox's gun-free zone bill when it started. So when it started out, we opposed it vehemently, but it had some changes along the way. Yeah, I called uh, Senator Talbot and said, Kirk, do you understand what what your bill's doing? That this your bill will will prohibit uh, concealed carry, permitless con- constitutional carry at any school, uh, any elementary, secondary, collegiate, or professional professional sporting event. Any sporting event, you can't ever have a concealed carry. And of course, in the entire French Quarter of New Orleans, it's amazing to me how the French Quarter, which arguably is the most dangerous place in the entire state of Louisiana at certain times would be the place where they always focus on law-abiding people not being able to carry a gun. But this bill in original form included all sporting events as well. So I reached out for Kurt and said, Kurt, this is not acceptable. You can't do this. We just passed constitutional carry. And so Kurt, because of some healthy pressure from us and from others, he eliminated this and he submitted a substitute bill, which now simply prohibits, uh, stiffens the penalties for carrying if you're intoxicated or for negligent carrying. But as far as any prohibition against concealed carry, that is now gone and out of the bill. And I'd like to acknowledge, uh, you know, the the LeCag supporters, State of Freedom supporters for reaching out and helping us to get that done. Because if that bill had passed in original form, Danielle, it would have been a very significant erosion of the Second Amendment. Yeah. And we have to also appreciate the longstanding gun lobby in the state of Louisiana, who I know were opposed to this and opposed to all the bills that we were opposed to that would have infringed on the Second Amendment. So appreciate you guys for y'all have been here longer than us. So thanks for the work that y'all are doing. They do a great job down there. I'm excited to share a fantastic opportunity for State of Freedom listeners who are interested in investing in precious metals or even starting a home-based business in the precious metals industry. Metal Stacks is a precious metals collector's club where you can buy your metals at the best prices on the market, actual dealer cost. They are beating the big sites. They have no credit card fees and no minimums. If you're just interested in purchasing metals at a great price, visit metalstacks.com forward slash D Walker. Get to shopping. That helps me out. I get the commission. You can also refer people to Metal Stacks for an additional income. If you're interested in learning about the referral business aspect of Metal Stacks, email me directly at danielle at freedomstate.us for more information. This bill passed the Senate in a 27 to 9 vote. And as you said, Talbot took some serious heat and was receptive to the pushback. So he offered significant amendments in the House Criminal Justice Committee, which turned the bill into something that we were neutral on or could even support. It passed the House 55 to 46 with a complete mixed bag of votes, but largely the conservatives opposed it. The Democrats, Chad Brown, Robbie Carter, and Travis Johnson joined them. This was signed by the governor on June 10th and becomes effective on July 4th, which is the effective date for a lot of these 2A bills. Good symbolic significance there. Yeah. All right. Next up, House Bill 62 by Representative Danny McCormick, probably the biggest fighter for the Second Amendment in our state, I would say. I mean, that's I guess that's a little over the top because there's a lot of people who who do really strongly support it. I I think he and Senator Miguez in the legislature are probably the two who consistently show up on this issue. So thanks to both of those gentlemen. But Representative McCormick is really aiming high for his his bill here. And it was a strong statement with the Second Amendment that would have given local law enforcement the right to stop the feds from seizing gun owners guns should they come and try and do that in Louisiana. Yeah. And would have 
strictly prohibited the enforcement of any federal executive administrative actions regarding guns, like by the FT, by, by the, uh, what is it, the, uh, the ATF? ATF, yeah. They're always coming out with these executive decrees that restrict Second Amendment rights. They haven't been passed by Congress, and this would have strictly prohibited any enforcement and would have allowed action in even the arrest of officials who sought to enforce those federal executive decrees regarding the Second Amendment in our state. It was a very, very strong, strong statement. Danny said that there were some issues with the bill that he needed to continue to work through. So I believe that he deferred it uh, until next session. Uh, But I I really, really will be on board with this bill next session and hoping to get this across the finish line. Representative McCormick, Danielle, is probably the strongest, most vocal Second Amendment advocate in the entire legislature. I don't think that's a stretch to say that. Yeah, I don't think it's a stretch to say it either. I don't want anyone else to think that they're not supporting it, but he has been out there and he doesn't compromise on it. He, I think his perspective is pretty much spot on with my perspective, which is shall not infringe. Yes, exactly. In fact, we're going to get some T-shirts made, say, what part of thou shall not infringe do you not understand? And then at the bottom, it's going to say McCormick slash Walker. (laughs) All right. Next up, Senate Bill 194 by Senator Miguez. This is the state preemption law, Chris. Yep. Uh, very, very simple bill, very important bill, which says that no local municipality, no local government can impose any ordinance or make any law regarding the Second Amendment that is more restrictive than state law. In other words, we're not going to have Orleans Parish passing an ordinance that restricts concealed carry. They can't do that. The law is the law in the state of Louisiana, and it prohibits the passage of any local ordinance that makes the Second Amendment right more onerous within that parish or within that municipality. You could make an argument, Danielle, that because it is state law, that by constitutional law, state law would automatically preempt any municipal ordinance or law that is inconsistent with state law. But I love the fact that Senator McGuess codified this and puts local ordinances and local municipalities on notice. Stay away from the Second Amendment. Yeah, I love it, too. It passed Senate Judiciary C in a five to one vote with the lone Democrat on the committee, Regina Barrow, opposing it. It passed the Senate on party line votes in a 28 to 11 uh, vote. Passed House Criminal Justice 8-4 to four with Democrat Roy Adams joining the Republicans in support. Yet again, Representative Adams championing the Second Amendment, and it passed the House largely on party line votes, and it was a 73-25 to 25 vote. Democrats Roy Adams, Robbie Carter, Marcus Bryant, and Travis Johnson joined the Republicans in favor, and Republican Joe Stagney joined the Democrats in opposing it. It was signed by the governor on May 15th and will become effective on August 1st. Really, really a shocker that that, <laughs> uh, that Joe that Joe Stagney lined up with the Democrats. I uh, know. So true. All right. Here we go. Senate Bill 234, also by uh, Senator Miguez. And this one prohibits the state government from contracting with any company that discriminates against firearm manufacturers through debanking or otherwise. We were big supporters of this one. Absolutely. Very strongly supportive. Another very good gun protection bill by by Senator Miguez and simply says if no political subdivision in Louisiana can do business with any company that is discriminating against any firearm entity, firearm trade association, firearm manufacturer, ammunition manufacturer, you just cannot do it. And if you're doing that, then the attorney general is authorized to take injunctive action against that company, against the uh, political subdivision in the state that's violating the law. You know, again, this is consistent with the Second Amendment. We have the right to keep and bear arms, and we're not going to be restricting or trying to choke out manufacturers' ability to make guns, manufacture guns, and ammunition for law-abiding citizens. And that's what he's trying to prevent here. Yeah. And it passed through the committees without any problems. The vote in the Senate was 2710 on strict party lines. 
The vote in the House was 64-23 on party lines with Representative Delisha Boyd joining the Republicans. I'm not sure if that was an accident or if she just heard the word discrimination and voted for it because she's typically <laughs> not with us. <laughs> right. right but, exactly. I got a feeling that's what happened. I think that's what happened. It was signed by Governor Landry on June 11th and will become effective on August 1st. All right, Chris, last bill up. Senate Bill 152, also by Senator Miguez. And this bill was just making some technical fixes to his bill from the special session on crime. And that bill actually provided limited liability for only permitted concealed carriers who use their firearm lawfully in self-defense. That's right. And we tried and we asked and we spoke directly with Governor Landry's office to try to get SB 152 amended to make sure that permitless carriers have the same liability protections if they have to use their gun as carriers who get a government issued permit. They understood the position. They said, we understand the position, but right now it's not the right time to do this, this, that, and the other, but we are on record supporting this because right now, as it stands in Louisiana, Danielle, permitless carriers still by law have less liability immunity, less liability protection if they have to use their guns than a person who has a government-issued concealed carry permit. That is a flagrant discrimination. It violates the Second Amendment and really violates the spirit of SB1, which is the concealed carry codification that was just passed in the criminal session. This is something that's going to be at the top of our priority list. Next session, Governor Landry's office said, we're going to try to get this done right now. We got too many people opposed to it. The people, uh, by the way, Danielle, one of the reasons I guarantee to you why they don't want permitless carriers, even permitless carriers who have all the training they need and know exactly what they're doing. The reason why they want them all to continue to have to get these concealed carry permits is because the state of Louisiana makes millions of dollars every year off of these permits. Which should be illegal. It's unconstitutional to permit us to carry a gun. It's not up to them to grant permission. Exactly. It's not up to the government to grant permission for a law-abiding citizen to carry a gun. And the idea that this would have been hung up because they're making money off of it just really adds insult to injury. I think we're going to really push hard on this next session, and we're going to get this amended. We don't have any choice. we got to do it. You know what, Chris? Louisiana has been at the forefront of a lot of things this year. And even in the last couple of years with some of our AG-led initiatives, and we are seeing some big cases at the Supreme Court related to the Second Amendment. We just saw the bump stock ban get repealed. It was struck down by as unconstitutional, I believe, just last week. And I believe there was another um, SCOTUS decision that said that just because you were a felon doesn't mean that now that you're out of jail, you don't have the right to carry a gun. I think that happened last week as well. You can correct me if I'm wrong, if you know about that one, Chris. But I think that we're seeing more and more support out of the Supreme Court for the Second Amendment. And Louisiana needs to be at the forefront of making a way for our people to carry as much, whenever, however they want to do it. The government doesn't get to tell you how, when, why, or what. They don't. So we need to start reasserting that right. Absolutely. And the presumption is always in favor of law-abiding citizens' right to conceal carry, right to carry. And we have to remember, Danielle, that the reason why the Founding Fathers insisted upon the Second Amendment was principally in order to protect against government encroachment, government tyranny, a government that is out of control. So how supremely incongruous is it when considering the purpose and the basis for the Second Amendment that we ever would have to rely on the government itself to grant us permission to conceal carry or to carry a firearm. That's the very entity that warrants and justifies and makes the Second Amendment so critical. Uh, And it's been turned on its head. Fortunately, we're making a lot of progress, as you said, in this state. The Supreme Court seems to be leaning heavily in favor of the Second Amendment, and I am so happy to see that. Yeah, me too. Me too. 
And I want us to be on the cutting edge, on the leading edge of this, not trying to play clean up and catch up. So these bills, this last set of bills has been great. And, you know, we're supportive of them. Let's take it as far as we can take it. Let's take it as far as we can we can take it. And I testified on a number of these bills. We had a lot of calls to action on this legislation, both the ones that were bad that we defeated and the legislation that was good that we helped get across the finish line. Very, very pleased about where we are now as far as the Second Amendment in Louisiana. And uh, we just have to continue to protect that all important right. Yeah. I'm convinced, Chris, that if we had less laws rather than more laws, we would be in a stronger position. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Yeah. So many of the laws that we're passing are laws that already exist. And we have to do that because our own government is not paying attention to the laws that we passed. Yes. If the laws that are on the books now were enforced faithfully and consistently, then we wouldn't have any need. We'd have a need for very, very few additional laws. We have an awful lot of laws on the books right now, a significant number of which are are not being enforced consistently and properly. You're exactly right. But, you know, Danielle, I've got great faith in the citizens of Louisiana. I have great faith in citizens' ability to know what's good, what's bad, and to be able to discern truth from lies. And one of the things that I feel very thankful for is the fact that we here at the State of Freedom are becoming a broader and broader platform and purveyor for truth without any censorship, unvarnished truth. Here's the information. Here's what you need to know. And increasing number of people are following the State of Freedom. I'm really blown away by how much we're being relied upon for pertinent information, both with regard to state issues in the legislature and national issues that affect the country as a whole. Yeah. And I'll I'll disagree with you on one point. Well, I, I think maybe just clarify. So we, we're not self-censoring, but we certainly are being censored. We're being censored on Facebook. We're being censored on Instagram. We're certainly being censored on YouTube and uh, shadow band and all of those locations. So if you're looking for us and can't find us there, It's not for lack of trying on our part. You know, I think places that have been very reliable for us that have not banned us, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, X slash Twitter and Rumble have been places that we haven't had our voice squelched yet. So very thankful for those platforms and their open arm view to the First Amendment, free speech. Absolutely. Absolutely. By the way, uh, which James Madison called the First Amendment, the free speech clause of the First Amendment, the most important provision of the entire Constitution. And I would put the Second Amendment a very, very close second. No doubt about that. Yeah, that's the enforcement mechanism, right? That's the enforcement mechanism. Well, Danielle, why does the time go by so fast when (laughs) we're having so much fun? Every day that we get a chance to do this, I want to take a minute to thank all of our listeners and subscribers to the State of Freedom, encourage your continued support through donations and sharing of our platform. Also, LACAG, the legislative watchdogs, are always looking out for you. And even when we're not in session, Danielle, we are doing a lot of work to plan legislation for the next session, to look ahead, to see what's coming down the pike so that we can continue to fortify freedom in Louisiana. Yes, we're continuing to build relationships and make connections. Next episode, you can look forward to hearing from us on a couple different things. We'll be talking about what happened on education, what happened with health and healthcare services, parental rights, pregnancy and abortion. So stay tuned for that. I think our final episode on this session in review wrap up will come after that. We'll be talking about all of the legislation related to protecting our elections. So stay tuned, stay with us. I know this is a lot that we've been trying to cover, but there's so much good that has happened this session. We want to make sure that you understand what is changing in our laws and and what's that going to mean for your life and for the future of our state. So thank you so much for sticking with us. If you would like to donate to the State of Freedom, we'd love for you to do that. If you could do it on a monthly basis, even a small dollar donation, because it just helps us to plan our budgeting. You know, it's hard to budget as it is, but any donations obviously help. But if you can make a commitment for a monthly support, 
that would be most, most welcome. You can do that at freedomstate.us and do the same at lacag.org. And until then, Danielle, with each passing moment, each hour of each day, with God's grace, vigilance, and determination, we will take grand steps to preserve the state of freedom in Louisiana. We will. Until next time, Chris, see you soon. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to The State of Freedom. To stay on top of all the calls to action we mentioned today, just check out the show notes for the episode. If you'd like to support the show financially, visit our website at freedomstate.us. If you'd prefer to give by mail, you can send a check to The State of Freedom, LLC, at P.O. Box 861, Berg, Louisiana, 70343. If you own a business in Louisiana and are interested in supporting our show by advertising, please email us at info at freedomstate.us. To get involved with Louisiana Citizen Advocacy Group, visit lacag.org, L-A-C-A-G dot org, or email Chris at chris at lacag.org. If you're enjoying the podcast, please subscribe and share it. Give us a five-star rating in the reviews. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next time.